Okay, so we should see uh, in the top left-hand panel of our Zoom windows, a uh, little red button, uh, which is flashing, which indicates we are recording. Uh, I will start time and turn the floor over to Group 10 to share with us their design. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our presentation. Today we'll be presenting the Dr. Clean Bioreactor, which, uh, so I'm Garrett and my other group mates are Ida, David, Jack, Vitan, Salo, and Denise. So our overall assembly, you can see we have a manipulator that's central to our system. It uh, completes a lot of the different functionalities of our system by transporting well plates and tubes to our various subsystems. We have two shakers capable of linear, double, orbital, and single orbital motion patterns. We have a sanitation system that will actually clean your well plates and tubes for you, and we'll get more into that later. We have uh, our control box here with our and uh, that is responsible for controlling our entire system as well as our OD and FI measurements. We have our environmental management system here. We have air injection systems here and liquid handling here. Our overall assembly costs $9,732.08. Its total weight is 94.69 kilograms and we're estimating that its technology readiness level is at a three. So our, our unique sanitation system actually cleans all of your well plates and tubes for you. So that's not something that you have to worry about at the end of your experiment. In addition to that, our, our system is easy to use and provides reliable measurements and processes due to uh, higher end equipment that we put inside of our system. All right, guys, I'm Salo. Uh, I was in charge of making the manipulator subsystem. So, here are some of the customer needs that were involved with the manipulator subsystem. The most important ones are highlighted in orange. Um, it was mainly just to make sure that it's able to uh, accommodate several sizes of well plates as well as test tubes, in particular the 15 milliliter and 50 milliliter test tube sizes. Here we have an isometric view and an exploded view of the manipulator. Um, the Y drive allows for motion from left to right. The X drive allows for motion in two directions that are perpendicular to that. Um, the linear actuator allows for motion in the Z direction or up and down. And the gripper is the one actually manipulating test tubes and well plates. And the mounting brackets seen here um, are what's actually fastening it to the top of the overall structure. Um, here it can be seen the NEMA stepper motor that's used to provide the power for the belt drive system. It's attached to a timing belt pulley, which corresponds to a driven timing belt pulley on the other side. Um, although the power is supplied by the belt, the weight is supported by a gliding rail, which is seen underneath the belt here, and it goes with the corresponding carriage. Um, these are made out of aluminum and um, they are specified to not use uh, any lubrication. Um, additionally, you can see that there's these belt clamps, which work with a pair of set screws. Um, and that's how the power is transmitted to um, either the X drive or the bracket that will be discussed later. Um, as you can see on the right image, there's a tensioning block, which works with a fixed panel as well as a moving panel which are connected by a set screw. And as this is turned by the user, um, the belt system is tuned to the tension that the user wants. Uh, here is the Y drive, which works very similarly to the X drive. Um, one of the main differences is that there is a belt pulley system on each side. Um, only one is driven by the NEMA 17 motor. Um, and they are connected with aluminum shafts, which allow for even power distribution. Um, if you can see on the image on the right, there's a similar tensioning block here. Um, the design is a little bit different, but the general concept is the same as the X drive. Um, the Z axis control are controlled by a linear actuator. Um, we have some of the specs on the right here. And the bracket that is mounted onto the X drive will be like CNC'd or milled. 
Um, it uses the same belt clamp that is used in the X and Y drives. And it, is, it has a carriage that corresponds to the guiding rail. The gripper itself is composed of a NEMA 8 motor, which we have some specs for here. Um, this is attached to a lead screw, which on the other end is attached to a low profile ball bearing, which allows it to rotate freely. Um, it's composed of two jaws, the one on the right of the top image is fixed in place, while the one on the left is movable, and it has attached the lead screw. So as the lead screw turns uh, counterclockwise, it moves right or left. And the gripper, I mean, the jaws are fitted with a neoprene no-slip pad. Um, this is attached using some kind of adhesive, such as epoxy or super glue. Um, the conical tube opener is required because if a scientist wants to open the tubes, um, they're just going to need it to be open to inject it with nutrients and stuff. So we've designed this. It's composed of a motor and a 3D printed um, conical structure, which allows caps of both sizes, both a 15 milliliter and 50 milliliter size to be opened. Um, so this works in conjunction with the manipulator. Manip manipulator picks up the tube, places it underneath, and as simple as that, it just unscrews it. Here's some calculations we did on the Y drive, just to make sure that the motors we selected um, would provide enough torque to be able to move the entire system. So we considered the torque needed to sustain a constant velocity as well as acceleration. Um, this involved taking the mass that's gonna be moved, um, the frictional coefficient of the guiding rails, uh, the force due to gravity, and the efficiency of the belt system, which is assumed to be 95%. Um, so those are the variables used for the torque required to maintain constant velocity. And for the torque for the acceleration, that involved us inputting a desired max speed, which is 60 degrees per second, and a time to reach that, which would be one second. Um, using these, as well as the total inertia of the system, we're able to calculate the torque due to acceleration. And summing these up, we got this number at the bottom, 0 0.001928 Newton meters. And this was found to be well below the torque provided by the NEMA 17 motor. We've also done some bending moment calculations as seen here. I've uh, provided a screen cap of the CAD as well as a diagram for ease of uh, understanding. We have F1 corresponds to the linear actuator as well as the gripper. F2 corresponds to the NEMA 17 motor. And R1 and R2 are reaction forces on either side. This is how the X drive is supported by the Y drive. Um, so we took a sum of moments with respect to uh, R2. And that's how we were able to solve for R2. Then we took a sum of forces solving for R1. and these were plotted on shear and bending moment diagrams as seen on the two images on the left. Um, we ignored force due to shear since the main, uh, the main stress here is due to bending. So we calculated the max bending here. Um, we found the second moment of area using the cross section on the top right. And we found it to be well underneath the yielding stress of the metal we used. So this is safe. And finally, we have the screw, the screw calculations. Um, we calculated a factor of safety using the stiffness constant, um, the preload. Uh, this, the stiffness constant is found by using the uh, bolt stiffness constant as well as the member stiffness constant, uh, KB and KM respectively, um, as well as the area, tensile area of the screw, which is a class uh, M5 class 10.9 screw. Uh, we're planning on using eight of these. And when we crunch the numbers, the factor of safety came out to be 1.2411. So it's deemed safe. All right, well, I'll be presenting the shaker subsystem today.
Um, so I'll click the next slide. Thank you. So the Shaker system address uh, is intertwined with a number of customer needs, but the primary one that I was concerned with was the linear orbital and double orbital shaking patterns. So I will be outlining some of those motions in a moment, but the shaker system itself is comprised of a shaker plate area where the well plates and tubes will be located. Uh, you'll notice a plate plug at the top to alternate between the 15 and mil 50 milliliter tube sizes. Um, the linear motion is controlled with a scotch choke mechanism. Uh, there are two drive gears here that are responsible for the orbital and double orbital patterns powered by a drive motor. Um, the second gear can be shifted downward using a linear actuator to uh, switch between the single and double orbital patterns so that one shaker system is capable of all three motions. The shaker body itself just protects the components inside. So the double uh, orbital motion pattern was modeled based on some old patents I found from the 50s and a guy who wanted to copy the way that hummingbirds flew for a little drone that he wanted to build. And it comprises of two um, gears that will be rotating with the same RPM towards each other and two rods that will be connected at a central point P, which here is shown to be the actual motor mount for the scotch yoke mechanism. Um, this allows for the double orbital motion. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, single orbital motions, as I was describing, can be created by just simply shortening the uh, linear actuator stroke length so that this second gear is no longer engaged. And the scotch yoke mechanism uh, creates the linear motion. I think that's a pretty uh, widely understood mechanism here, so I won't go too much further into that. So there was obvious concern with bending moment, having the entire shaker tray being supported by these two gear links. So I calculated the stress with a 1.2 factor of safety and found that it was only like 5,700 Pascals. And I used aluminum for those uh, links. So uh, they should not have any kind of issue with that. Move on. So to calculate the basic, the base level mo uh, motor torque and power requirements, I had to determine what the minimum uh, power and torque requirements would be. And so for the drive motor, I made the assumption that we would be operating at 300 RPM, which we found to be the upper range of ideal shaking speeds for cell culture aeration. And for the Scotch yoke motor, uh, I found that I used the lower end to 100 RPM because from uh, hydrostatics, I found that the abrupt change in acceleration from the uh, linear pattern actually posed a greater risk of causing some cross-contamination in the well plates. So I opted for the lower range of that optimal uh, speed range for that. Upon doing a vibrational analysis, I found the maximum force that should be generated by any of the uh, shaking patterns. It's pretty low, just 0.445 Newtons. And I calculated the natural frequencies of a couple points of interest that might uh, have concern if resonance was reached. I did the actual structure frame itself of the entire system and found it was very high. And then I did the shaker wall housing itself and the gear links. And all of them were well above any frequency that we expect to reach if our max speed is 300 RPM. Uh, upon a quick life cycle analysis on the gears and the links, we found that uh, both of them exist at a stress level pretty well below uh, what's considered to be the infinite life cycle uh, stress level. So these should all survive the uh, minimum tenure requirement posed by the bioboundary. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hirate, and today I'll be explaining to you the fluid handling system, uh, which, is, which includes the liquid handling system and the air injection. Um, here you can find all the customer needs that were related to this subsystem. Um, among all the ones that are highlighted are the ones that have been um, deemed more important, um, which include the ability to inject, measure, and regulate the composition of five different gases, um, the ability to dispense fluid without creating aerosols and avoiding cross-contamination, um, as well as the ability to dispense um, flow rate, which is between um, 225 to um, 300 microliters um, uh, per second, and doing all of this with the highest accuracy. Um, first of all, I'm gonna be presenting the um, liquid handling system, which is responsible for providing nutrients to cultures. 
as you can see in the picture, the system consists of three deposits, um, three solenoid valves, uh, fluid handling dispensing valves, and a pump. Um, as I've already said, different, um, the fluid dispensing system will prevent the creation of aerosols and cross-contamination. Um, further analysis of these aspects will be explained later on in the presentation. Thank you. So here we have the three reservoirs. Um, one of them is going to uh, fill with nutrients um, necessary for the cell culturing. Um, so then above, we enable the flow to um, we enable the flow um, through the tubes and then to the pump um, that is going to be responsible for driving it to the dispensing bulb. Um, once, the, once the experiment is over, the system will be sanitized with um, bleach, which um, is going to be um, in the second reservoir. Um, and this one's going to kill all the remaining equally in the in the tube. Um, the last reservoir is going to be filled with with sterilized water, um, which is going to be pumped through the system, removing any leftover waste um, in the system. The material system for this um, res these reservoirs or tanks um, were chosen to reduce the weight of the system and also the cost, um, and are mainly PVC and um, PMMA. Uh, when it comes to the dimensions, these um, reservoirs um, are 192 milliliters to be able to fit into the um, bioreactor. Um, here you can see a exploded view of this part of the ESO system. Um, as explained before, you can see the um, deposits um, with its mounts and screws to um, hold them to the, to the wall of the bioreactor, um, the tubes, um, PVC tubes, the solenoid valves, the pump with its um, motor and the um, pump mount. And um, in the next um, slide, I'm gonna um, further explain the solenoid valves and the pump. Okay, so here we go. The um, solenoid valves, um, what are solenoid valves? These are um, electromechanically operated control elements um, that are used to set or release um, fluid in, in a tube. Um, like the mechanism of a door, this allows we enable the fluid um, to flow towards the pump or to prevent it from flowing. Um, why do we choose this um, solenoid valve specifically? Um, this is chosen because of its size and mainly because of the weight and because of its um, push to connect fitting, which made everything um, um, much easier. Regarding the pump, um, the pump it will force the liquid to move along the tube. Um, at the higher flow rate. It was one of the um, constraints or the um, customer needs that the um, flow rate had to be between 125 microliters per second and 300 uh, microliters per second. Um, the one selected, which is the peristaltic pump OEM B01, um, actually has, um, has a flow rate from 0 0.0024 to 190 microliters per second, which um, fits the requirements by far. Um, in addition, this pump um, has also a compact structure. It's easy to operate and um, has an um, economical cost. It's very cheap. Um, along with the with the pump, um, Anima 17 supermotor um, is going to be placed in order to provide the pump with the necessary power. Um, here we have the fluid dispenser, which is the KOMDC um, automatic dispensing valve. Um, as you can see in the picture, the fluid dispenser is going to be um, attached to the wall thanks to these mounts and these screws. And then we're going to have um, the needle, which, um, as I'm going to explain now, um, can change between 0 0.5 millimeters to um, 1.8 millimeters. Um, um, also, these um, tips, as I said, are interchangeable. The over Overall weight of the fluid dispenser is 150 grams, and um, its dispensing tolerance is greater than 98%, which is mainly one of the reasons why the dispensing valve was chosen. Um, now we will go over the calculations um, done in this um, subsystem. Um, most of them were done just to make sure that the um, fluid dis the dispenser was made um, without creating aerosols and also that the um, optimization was avoided. Um, okay, so for no aerosols to be created, the flow must be laminar, which just means that the Reynolds number must be smaller than um, 2,300. Um, 
the thing is that we didn't know what the actual nutrients or um, fluid were going to be used for the cell culturing. So um, for the um, calculations, water has been used. Um, here you can see the um, the properties of the water used for the for the actual calculations. Um, okay, so with this, the using the Reynolds numbers, the um, boundary diameters were calculated, and as you can see, these are very very small. Um, as it was requested in um, December 2, um, further calculation and optimization has been done. Um, this analysis followed the um, study done by um, Arthur H. Um, Lee Febra, I think that's how you say it. Um, and um, in this case, the risk of optimization um, is measured as a function of the optimal wavelength for breaking up the, the liquid jet. Um, so we can here we have two methods, the Rayleigh method and the Weber method. Um, and these are the um, equations they use for calculating the actual wavelength, where D is the um, initial diameter of the, of the jet. Um, on the right on the top, we can see also the um, way they had to calculate the actual diameter of the drop, um, which can be seen in this picture um, down below. Um, Weber also had another um, equation or way to measure the the um, optimum wavelength, but um, this only was for um, in the cases where the actual relative velocity from the uh, of the jet and the air was um, different from zero. Um, when the this relative velocity increased, the actual wavelength of the um, the optimum wavelength decreased, and also the um, drop diameter. Um, in this case, as you can see, the um, with the nozzle chosen, um, we have calculated the the corresponding velocities, and all of them are very close to zero. So in that case, um, our optimum wavelength wouldn't wouldn't change in the other um, method either. Um, we obviously calculate also the pressure and the um, the pressure difference to the system, so uh, we could ensure that the um, flow distance involved and the um, pump met these requirements. Um, and it was a zero point um, fifty nine pascal. Um, the dose involved um, in this in this um, under these conditions of pressure um, actually has um, a volumetric flow rate of um, 350 megaliters per second, which again is above the requirement, which was um, 300. Um, now I'm going to explain the the gas injection system, uh, which is capable of injecting, measuring, and regulating the composition of five different gases. Um, as you can see here, the system is completely automated, so um, the user will be able to adjust the composition of the flow rate um, uh, to the tubes from our controller. Um, again, as you can see in the picture, on the left side, we have the exploded view with, um, there's the tank first, the automatic pressure regulator, which is going to um, regulate the pressure, and um, the saline valve, which um, is going to um, enable to the air of the gas to flow through the, through the PVC tube. Um, although these gases are not, um, toxic or flammable, uh, we needed a system to evacuate these um, gases out of the main cluster of the, bi the bioreactor, um, just to make sure that in every um, experiment, we have the exact um, amount of composition of gases um, to carry out the experiment. So um, for this, um, a vacuum style system was designed in which um, a motor fan is going to absorb the, um, all the gases. And um, after that, the gases are going to go through a gas filter to um, purify them. Um, after that, the last step is that these gases will go through an exit pipe, um, which um, doesn't have to have this this um, shape. It will just um, it will have to be adjusted depending on the um, like laboratory specification. Hello, my name is Denise Pena. I will be going over the sanitation system. Uh, these are the customer needs for the sanitation system. Uh, most relevant ones are no cross-contamination and it should be able to neutralize and sterilize the liquid and solid waste generated within the system. 
as well as um, the spray system not creating aerosols. The sanitation system is comprised of a housing structure that contains all the parts and the cultures. It has a retractable lid so the manipulator can actually come inside the system. A combo reservoir and pump system so bleach and distilled water can be pumped through this fluid spray pipes and the fluid spray system as well as a drain. Um, here is a closer look at the retractable panel and seal. But before we get into that, I'd like to go back and talk about how the system functions. Um, the fluid spray system works this way. The bleach pump, the bleach reservoir pump combo would pump bleach through the, the fluid spray system using a D5 pump. And um, I don't know, it can't be clearly seen, but there are nozzles and a nozzle adapter. And that will spray bleach onto the, the well plates and cultures, well, which will sterilize not only the, the well plates, but should be able to douse the bacteria and kill all the bacteria. That will then go into the waste system. And yeah, next, please. Uh, here's a retractable panel on the seal. Um, we use a rack and pinion system along with the seven RPM and gear motor. So linear motion can be driven through the, the retractable panel. And we have a rubber seal, um, one that's attached to the retractable lid with the wiper, and one that's adhered to the fixed panel of the structure. Here is a look to the fluid spray and reservoir system. Uh, we use, the, again, uh, reservoir tanks, which should hold roughly 150 milliliters of bleach and water, but it can be expanded upon. Um, if there's no size constraints within the system, we have reservoir mounts that can be attached to the reservoir tank and have a tightening screw um, on the side. Uh, the PVC piping and making up the fluid spray system as well as T and 90 degree elbow connectors and pipe clamps to mount it to the fixed panel of the structure. Uh, the nozzle was selected using uh, a Reynolds number to limit the risk of aerosol creation and a desired velocity, arbitrary velocity of 0.4 meters per second. Using the Reynolds number formula, we, we found a maximum allowable diameter for the nozzle and looked through off the shelf parts for a matching um, nozzle diameter and determined its uh, flow rate. Uh, the pump required was, the pump used was uh, determined using initially the flow rate of the nozzle um, and the, the head loss formula. We determined that it can, it should be able to trans to, to use 0 0.012 watts of power and our pump can actually do 0 0.86 or the pump itself can do 24 watts of work, but the head loss um, is 0 0.86 watts and the differential pressure that I used to overcome is 2.06 and it was found using the difference in height between the uh, supply line of the pump and the, the, the top of the fluid spray system. Um, we also determined the torque and motor speed required to, to move the retractable panel and that's how we um, found a proper motor to use. The mass of the panel should be 0 0.43 kilograms using, I think, polypropylene as a material. And using the, the length from the center of the gear to the edge of the panel and the, and the mass of the system, the torque work required was 0 0.64 newton meters. And the motor, the seven RPM mini gear motor has a torque of 140 inch ounces, which is roughly 0 0.98 Newton meters. And it, that's more than enough to, to move the panel. We use the gear ratio of the 15, milli, 15 centimeter rack and the 24 to 24 pitch gear to determine the, the speed, the linear speed out, which is 0 0.6 meters per second. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Vitan. I'll be presenting the uh, temperature control environmental management uh, subsystem. We've been looking forward to this day a long time. So thank you for coming. Uh, these are the main customer needs that are addressed in this subsystem and principally highlighted in orange uh, are everything that has to do with the temperature variation. So we want to maintain the goal temperature while reaching it within a set point uh, of plus or minus 2.5 degrees Celsius, as well as achieving such a temperature within a desired time frame. in this case, 15 minutes. Okay, so the environmental management subsystem can be conceptualized as a contained closed loop system, which uh, should not produce any sort of condensation or release heat within the enclosed space of the bioreactor, which has electrical components that are delicate and sensitive. And comparable systems are assemblies using a refrigerant or a heating mechanism contained within an enclosed space, such as a PC tower or an actual fridge. And so the refrigerant approximation is gonna circulate a medium of refrigerant Freon R134A, which will alter the pressure of air within the condenser to promote the overall transfer of heat. Okay, and so using the Freon R134A refrigerant, the estimated thermal capacity rated from the manufacturer is 400 watts in cooling, assuming the same eight millimeter copper tubing and ideal gases. And this will more than likely be primarily at lower temperatures, such as at a range of five to 70 degrees Celsius, which will be the operating range of our experiment here. And the exhaust temperature could reach higher temperatures than that, such as around 80 to 100 degrees Celsius, which will ne uh, necessitate the, the installment of uh, insulation similar to the enclosure, such as S fiberglass or uh, a greater thickness of sheet metal, which in this case will be an aluminum alloy to protect the delicate components in the enclosure. And the condenser is rated at 2200 BTU hours for power generation with the units being the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So uh, looking at the uh, path of air intake within the actual subsystem, it's going to be present uh, to ensure that the heat exchanger's vapor compression cycle does not affect any other aspect of the assembly. So the intake fans are gonna be present on the front end of the subsystem with a uh, deliberate uh, 80 millimeter uh, diameter. And so these will be deliberately curved so that the flows simulated are going to be uh, linear within the enclosure in a singular direction from uh, air coming in from every direction. And so the heat exchanger is going to be able to work uh, either as a condenser or a compressor within the vapor compression system, working in, in conjunction uh, directly from instructions from the controller in order to operate based off the inputs that the lab technician gives. The exhaust exit for the hot air uh, is simply going to be two vented exits, which are going to have a pathway to the exterior of the exclosure or enclosure, I'm sorry. Uh, and there's going to be an upper uh, entryway for the manipulator to be able to control through actu actuation uh, access to the interior of the subsystem. Uh, and there's going to be uh, ideally uh, uh, an enclosed space so that there's not going to be air gaps uh, within the actual subsystem. And so we performed a heat transfer analysis to maintain that the airflow within the actual enclosure is not going to be turbulent. And we found that uh, through the Raleigh number, the, the airflow is going to be laminar and there won't be an issue with uh, the actual rating of the heat capabilities of the heat exchanger. So uh, the cost uh, ramps up exponentially when you go to a higher rated for a, for a larger system, you know, something theoretically. But uh, calculating the time to heat the interior of the enclosure from room temperature to an average operating range around 55 degrees Celsius shows us through the material properties of the aluminum enclosure that it's not going to be an issue in, in regards to time and that constraint is going to be met. And so uh, another thing that we had uh, done to investigate the heat loss within the actual enclosure and investigate whether that would be an issue in regards to the electrical components within the enclosure, we found that the maximum heat loss is gonna be calculated at 90 watts at ambient outside air temperature and the maximum uh, worst case scenario threshold temperature in the enclosure, uh, which won't be an issue in regards to the thermal matrix that we had seen with present and insulation and the thermal conduct conductivity of the aluminum alloy present. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Jack Johan. I, I was in charge of the control subsystem. Um, some of the most important customer needs for this one was having a an, 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 uh, very good uh, user interface, easily seen visual indicators, um, including uh, photobioreactor mode, along with uh, ODFI measurements, and that you can process those measurements in six and a half minutes. Uh, the controls of the system are run by three Arduino Uno Revolution 3s, 
They will each control certain areas of the bioreactor. One Arduino will be tasked with control of the manipulator and shaker subsystems. Another will handle the liquid handling, gas injection, photo bioreactor mode. Final one is tasked with controlling the environmental management and sanitation, sanitation subsystems. The Arduinos will be controlled from an interface active on a laptop or computer. The interface will be coded using a C++. This interface will provide the user with all the active data and current interactions of the bioreactor. The flowchart demonstrates how the interface will work the bioreactor. Bio the manipulator being a main part of the system, we have designed it so that we will have predefined functions programmed in, but there will also be a manual, manual control available to the user. Each subsystem will have inputs for the bioreactor to perform pre-designed tasks based on the time and size, and this is a case for the shaker, liquid handling, or ODFI readings. The interface will also have a kill switch. This will also uh, be a button available on the main structure for extra safety. The ODFI readings, um, you can go to the next slide. The ODFI readings will be housed outside of the main structure and they will be conducted by a Thor's lab compact spectrometer model CCS-175. Uh, the readings will be taken by using a probe that is mounted with inside the unit. The unit will take measurements in the visible light spectrum so not to incur damage to the bacteria cultures. The spectrometer, while expensive, can take up to 200 measurements per second. So we'll, take a, we'll be able to take multiple measurements per cell for better precision and more data for the user. The spectrometer will work in cooperation with the manipulator to take measurements because they can do a complete cycle of measurements in 1.87 uh, minutes as shown by the calculations. The spectrometer probe is mounted in a custom mount and will take the measurements by moving the weld plates under each individual, individual cell using the manipulator arm. All the data from the spectrometer is then reported back to the user on the interface. The photo bioreactor mode um, is a design that uses a Nylite 36 watt modified RGB LED light bar. This will provide white light to the photosynth photosynthesized bacteria using a combination of red, blue, and green light. And through our research that shows that this combination of light will be able to provide the necessary white light used in photosynthesis. Overall, the combination of the height and the wattage of the bulbs provide a light intensity of 21.3 watts uh, per meter squared. Good afternoon, my name is David Cruz and I'll be presenting the general structure for our design. So these are the listed customer needs that our design satisfies with a focus on customer needs that were determined to be of main priority. Okay, so this is the general CAD model of the structure. Its main purpose is to support all of the other subsystems while fitting within the customer's parameters for its dimensions. It is based on a 3D printer and you will see it uh, enclosed it has an enclosure within it. It's consisted of five main components, which are is it consists of the bar frames, the outer panels, the inner panels, the insulation within, and also the front window and door that you see listed here. There's also some three minor components, which include the on-off switch, the emergency shutoff switch, and the window film that I will get to in a minute. So this is a general frame of the overall structure. We decided to make it out of aluminum 2024 because it needs to be able to support all of the other subsystems and it needs to be sturdy enough to do so. For the actual panels inside, there are panels on every single side of the structure and it's made out of ABS plastics on all sides of it. However, on the upper and lower panel, there is also an additional stainless steel sheet metal because it needs to be able to support the subsystems that hang from the above portion, and it needs to be able to support the weight of all of the other subsystems beneath it. Aluminum has a yield strength of approximately 324 megapascals, and our total compressive strength for our structure only comes out to 200 and approximately 260 kilopascals, and that's less than 0.1% of the overall yield strength, even with a factor of safety, presumably of five, we are still well within the range to be able to support the entire structure. So the door is actually consist, consist of a few multi-pole neodymium 
permanent magnets. Essentially, the layout of the door is this, where there is a small gap in between the magnets. So how this works is that these two magnets will be held in either direction, North Pole or South Pole, facing either direction. And they will be fastened you, um, because there, is, there are counter sunk holes within the actual magnets themselves. So they'll be able to hold themselves together. As you can see, there's also a crevice in between the to the door and the panel behind it. This is to minimize the contamination that could be able to spread within the actual crevice if there was no 90 degree angle. So we decided to minimize this by creating a essential barrier for anything that could reach inside of the actual structure. Additionally, the magnets are able to have a maximum pulling force of around 10 pounds. So it doesn't make it too much, uh, it doesn't take too much strength to be able to pull the door without uh, being able to do so effectively to get inside. Now there's a few other components that were made priority for the general structure. One of them was the insulation because we wanna make sure that there's no contamination from the outside and that there are other external factors don't affect the cell cultures themselves. The actual, uh, the actual structure will be insulated with S fiberglass cloth. And we decided to go with this because it has a very low conductivity rate compared to others and is not very expensive at all. If you see below, there's the thermal conductivity of water, which is approximately 0.6, and of standard aluminum, which is 237 watts per meter Kelvin. So it is much more comparable to water than it is to aluminum, assuming, yes. Additionally, there's also gonna be a window film on the front, and this is to minimize the amount of light intensity that can reach within this structure. We don't want the cell cultures to be affected by this. So this needs to be balanced with the human's visibility as well. So there's a balance between the actual film, its polarization, and the visibility that a human can see within certain wavelengths. It's gonna be a polymer chemical film and it can be pretty flexible. You can use an adhesive to attach on, onto the window or it can also be fastened through the outer panel. This is the overall subsystem. So after our presentation, you might be wondering still why Dr. Clean? But in addition to being easy to use, having reliable state-of-the-art components, I'm just gonna run a scenario by you that I think we have all dealt with before, where you come home and you look into your kitchen and you have a pile of dishes in your sink. And if you thought cleaning up crusty pasta sauce was bad, I do not think that two week old E. coli cultures are gonna be much better. So the Dr. Clean does it for you. Um, thank you guys so much for coming to our presentation. We'd like to take a moment to thank our professors, Dr. Trom and Dr. Nimi, the wonderful TA team, all of our past uh, MAE professors that have taught us the skills we needed to do this project. And of course, we'd like to thank our corporate sponsors. And now we'd also like to open the floor to any questions and comments. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all again. David, recognize some of you guys here. This is uh, Mike Fitzgerald. Um, Dr. Trom is dealing with a couple of things at the moment. It's the end of the semester, so he's, he's trying to put out fire. So I'll sort of kick us off here. Um, so yeah. Uh, just starting off, I really appreciated um, you guys specifically addressing meeting the customer need requirements. A lot of other groups didn't do that, so I thought that was very well done. Um, and just one question for me, did you guys use R134A as your refrigerant? Yes, sir. That's what we did. Okay, so a Andy or someone else could correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's been banned for domestic use as of January one of this year. So it's sort of unlucky timing. Um, I, I, I had a, yes, sir. I had investigated using like a, a water cooling system, which we also did for the fluid handling that I that I mixed due to cost reasons. So it wouldn't be any sort of issue to change that back. I just I didn't know that. So thank you so much. Yeah. No. I yeah. I just wanted to point. Is there an alternative? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the, these types of uh, heat exchangers, they uh, sometimes they're exclusive to one medium, but as long as there's a vapor compression cycle that's reversible that can be followed, it, it technically should be possible to switch that medium. And I'll, I'll get to work right on that because I wasn't aware of that. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. That's it for me.
Okay, can I ask a couple of questions? So, um, uh, really good presentation, a lot of good technical detail, uh, which was good. Um, the uh, kind of going back to some of the structural analysis early on um, with the pulleys and things, um, you know, it was good that you looked at uh, yield strength and, and, you know, and such um, for your structures. Um, I think that uh, understanding more around displacement uh, would have been uh, good to see, you know, uh, everything's going to displace under load to a certain extent. So if, if and how much it displaces, how does that affect the system? Um, that's maybe one comment. The belt tensioner system might be something where I'm not sure what you referenced um, looking at existing belt tensioner arrangements, but the, uh, the that usually this usually we would use some kind of curved surface or even a rotating surface to tension a belt. Otherwise, you're going to get friction and and I noticed it had some nice 90 degree corners on it as well, which um, are just going to rub on the belt probably. Um, so that was another comment. Um, the There were a few places where you had some fans um, for various purposes. And, you know, one thing to think about with fans is whether you need some kind of a flap um, to ensure that you only get one, one directional flow. Um, you know, you don't want contaminants when the machine switched off. You don't want contaminants to find the way back in to the box via the fan opening, um, you know, when the fan's not running. So um, so that's something there. And then again, regarding fans, um, you know, the I think there was in one in one area we talked about um, controlling the heat um, using the fans, uh, you know, evacuating heat from the from around that radiator. Um, so I don't know if there's if there was a plan there or whether you had that in the design for um, uh, any kind of fail safe. So if the fan fails, uh, would something overheat, uh, you know, or would, would something that might switch uh, switch something off so that it, you don't you know you don't get overheat or some indicator that the fan has failed or something like that. Um, so that was another another comment about that. Um, the the only other thing I would say is, and maybe I missed it, but at the very beginning, um, you know, throughout the whole presentation, you did a great job of going into a lot of detail about all the calculations and things. Uh, I still am not sure I have a thorough understanding of how the whole system works, um, you know, and that's probably something that you know, for, for folks who are working on the system, it becomes obvious to you guys, but um, just a tip for future presentations is just bear in mind that sometimes you have to kind of show some basic, um, hey, here's, how, here's our system and here's how it's going to work. Um, you know, here's the steps, uh, you know, step one, two, three, four, whatever, how this system's going to work. Um, uh, that, you know, that might help me a little bit with, with understanding what, what all the subsystems are doing in what order. Um, so that was, that's just my comments on that. But great job, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I didn't consider the sagging for the manipulator, but definitely some displacement calculations can be done alongside the bending moment uh, calculations. And as far as the tensioning system goes, I did research like having something that you can pull rotationally so that the driven pulley could be tensioned. But since it's all happening in a, an enclosure, I think it'd be kind of hard or a little bit tight for space to have a rotational component like that. So I just try to make something that's more space efficient with a set screw. But yeah, we'll definitely uh, do some extra calculations for uh, displacement. Well, I'll, I'll jump so in on, on the comments. on the topic of, of structures. You guys, uh, this is Tom Singer from North of Grumman. You guys did and probably the most thorough and uh, and I'd say most mature, uh, you know, from from the standpoint of like uh, you know knowing your stuff, uh, structural analysis. I'd 
I mean, I, I sent Dr. Trauma a message when you put up a sheer moment diagram, uh, you know, that, that warms my, my crusty old heart. Um, you, you guys did a, a really good job with that, and I, I appreciate the thoroughness. I would point out that I think you mentioned a 1.2 factor safety. Um, SpaceX is out there designing rockets, uh, which are very, very, very weight constrained with a 1.5 factor safety. Um, you are significantly sportier than that. I, I think I remember seeing in the customer needs statement that they had a 1.2 factor safety specified. Uh, that's probably a situation where they don't know exactly what they want. Um, so I, I would I would encourage you to kind of rethink that. I don't think you're you're close to your structural capabilities, uh, so I don't think that would be a problem. But you know, for something like this, I would expect a factor safety more in the range of of like three to five. Um, but Structural analysis was was very thorough, very complete, and I'm I'm thrilled to see it. Uh, on the uh, on the fluid system, uh, it's you've got three uh, you've got nutrients and you've got bleach and and I I forget what the other uh, what the other fluid was that that you're pumping in there, and they're all plumbed together uh, into tubes ahead of the pump. Um, what's going to prevent uh, you know, contamination of, of like bleach into your nutrient system ahead of your pump, and, and how do you plan to deal with that? Um, okay, so, so you're right. It's three different reservoirs, and then they all um, are connected into one single tube. But um, first, it's the nutrients, then it's the bleach that, um, as we explained, um, it's going to make sure that there's no, um, like, there are no. Um, there are no components that could react in other um, reactions, like um, in further experiments. And then the um, sterilized water is going to be the one in charge of cleaning the whole system. So we're assuming that no um, leftover waste is in the in the system after the bleach and after the sterilized water. So um, when doing the experiment again, like we won't have any problem, and um, the the nutrients or the tubes um, will not be um, will have no contamination. Okay. Uh, what what drove you to rigid PVC versus something like a, a flex tube? Because every every time you have a coupling in there, there's a potential for something to leak, to break. You've got stress concentrations when things, you know, potentially tend to vibrate. Uh, what what drove the PVC decision? Um, actually, it's um, shop PVC tubes. Um, the only thing is that um, for the wiring, they were done that way, but they're actually soft PVC tubes. Um, the ones that are rigid PVC are the, the air injection system. Okay, maybe I misunderstood that. Uh, I had a couple other notes here. Uh, I, I have a note about the R134A as well. Uh, you've got uh, a bleach spray system, and it, that that's something that, that you guys decided, hey, that's going to be like your, I, I think Dr. Trom was calling it your hedgehog concept. Um, that's that's not driven by a particular customer requirement. That's your own sort of like killer app for your uh, your system. Is that correct? Yes. When we originally started looking at the customer needs and trying to separate them into separate subsystems, uh, we were under the assumption that we would have to include a sanitation system because of the uh, no cross contamination and ha it has to be able to sequester and neutralize its own, its own liquid and solid waste. So we just assumed it have to be part of the overall system, which is why we designed for it. Okay. Yeah, it turned out to work in our favor, though. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's an interesting feature. I wonder. Uh, yeah, I I wonder how much you know additional complexity that that buys, and and you know if, if that's something that's really going to allow a customer for uh, you know potentially cost and complexity savings that that you could have had otherwise. The system did end up increasing the cost a lot. I think the sanitation system itself was uh, roughly 1400 which uh, seems pricey when it's mostly made out of plastic and PVC. Mm -hmm. It's a good note, metal. actually. I hadn't, hadn't thought about, like, you know, say the trade-off with that, but... Um, uh, Everything's a trade-off. Yeah, yeah. But no, that's a great note. Hey, this is Rick Miles, Northrop Grumman. I, I just want to piggyback on Tom's thing. I, I, I really love seeing a sheer moment diagram as well. Um, but uh, I had a quick question on the uh, uh, the wells. Uh, do you have a cover for it? Um, 
I, I didn't see that in there. Uh, maybe I missed it. Oh, I'm sorry. You, oh, sorry. No, no, you're good. Okay, so are you referring to um, like a cap for the well plates? Yes. So yeah, we assume that they would have a cap um, if the experimenters don't want to have it spilling everywhere. So um, the manipulator is hopefully accurate enough to where it can set down the well plate and like on the floor and then lift off the cap and then continue to do operations with the well plate without the cap on. Okay, yeah, yeah. I guess my concern was uh, when, when it's on the shaker table, right? Um, uh, whether or not you've got something to prevent any spillage. Right, so um, I did some hydrostatic calculations as far as the actual liquid inside of it. But if you're talking about like, if like the well plate like falls off or something, there is a lip on that shaker tray that should be able to uh, stop it from moving over any side. Um, and the assumption would be that the uh, lid would be on the well plate for that process. Okay. Good job, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thanks for your feedback, for uh, All right, everybody. Sorry, sorry to interrupt sorry. here. We probably do have to wrap up because I know we've got this next group here at four o'clock. Um, Lido, I know you might you might have had a question, but uh, we probably should wrap up. So thank you guys for a great presentation, and uh, we're going to move on to the next group here. Good job. Hey, well, th thank you all so thank much, you. Lido. I'm sorry we didn't get to your question today. That's okay. You guys did a good job. Thank you all so much. And you look good, too. Much. Good job, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Thank Have a good much. day, guys. Take care. Really appreciate yeah. you all being here. You guys can rest easy over the weekend now. Take care, yeah. guys. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.